I am pretty convinced that we are in the last stages of of the ability for America to survive. We are in an end game right now. And that is not a liberal end game or a conservative end game. It's a combination of both. And we are uh, without mercy and we are without forgiveness. And we have to, we have to rethink that. We have to get it back into the earliest years of public schools so that your, your civic education is complete by high school graduation. It has nothing to do with college or university. And the more you explore that, the more you'll see why that's simple and commonsensical. I'm Dave Rubin and joining me today is an Academy Award winning actor, author of One Thought Scares Me. We teach our children what we wish them to know. We don't teach our children what we don't wish them to know. And a guy with a lot of moxie, Richard Dreyfus. Welcome to the Rubin Report. Hiya. Richard, you do have a lot of moxie. For some reason, that line seemed like the one that I should go to in the intro. I could have gone through about 800 movies. How do you feel about a Lost in Yonkers reference right up top? Hmm. Um, for some reason, every bio of me starts out with what a cocky, arrogant guy <laughs> I am, or was, or something. And uh, I don't really, I don't agree with it, but I don't, you know, want to start a war. So uh, I let it go. But I think it's just that I'm, I tell my truth. I tell the truth. I tell my truth, whether it's anti-Richard or pro-Richard. So, um, and I think that people are, are uh, surprised by that. There was an article once about the fact that Barbara Streisand and Richard Dreyfus were the only two Jews who talked about being Jews and loved it and, you know, didn't expect uh, any bad stuff to come for that. And I, and I know her and we talked about it and it never occurred to me not to talk about being Jewish. I was proud of it. And so, but it's the kind of thing that was covered by a lot of fear or a lot of uh, not being candid. Mm -hmm. You know, there were lots of the actors in the earlier years who were Jewish who wouldn't admit it, which I think is kind of silly. So... We could go in all ways to start, but why don't we do a little, a little bio first, uh, because everybody knows uh, you from, obviously, Jaws and Close Encounters and What About Bob, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but can you give me a little bit of a bio, because that'll kind of connect us to the book, because you have a sort of interesting childhood related to politics in terms of where you're at now. Yeah, um, I, was, I was born in Brooklyn to a very activist family, my great aunt assassinated Tsar Alexander in 1881, um, an act which I'm very proud of. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and my grandmother was a witness to the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire and walked away from that catastrophe and went directly to the Socialist Party headquarters and volunteered and eventually became Eugene Debs' private secretary. And um, I have always been their child and my mother's child. And uh, I once asked my mom, uh, why were you a socialist and not a communist? And she said, better donuts. Is that a fact? That's a fact. 
That's a fact. And we lived in Queens, in an area in Queens which was completely left-wing, completely socialist and communist. And uh, the guy who was the head of the Communist Party on Long Island uh, was a big, fat hospital administrator named David, and he used to tell me stories about uh, what it was like to, you know, be a part of the American Communist Party. And uh, most of the stories um, dealt in um, how s silly and stupid they were. And he's talking as a present-day communist. Right, he's like, right. He thought they were just, um, that his group was particularly silly. <laughs> and... Uh, and he was always telling me these stories because this is what America was so frightened of. And there was, my father was asked, uh, my father was not uh, a partisan. And he, he was asked to run for the Board of Education in Queens. We had crosses burned on our lawn and blah, blah. And so David called an executive cell meeting and all the top communists in Long Island met at his apartment and they went downstairs to the basement and David said, okay, we're here to, to try to convince Norman Dreyfus to, to run for the Board of Education, but it can't be a communist movement, it can't be anything you know, identified with us, so what, what do you think? How, how should we do this? And one guy said, well, I think we should do this, and another guy said we should do that, and then another guy said, well, speaking as a non-communist, I'd like to, and everyone went, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> and he, they just let him in because he was their pal Stanley, and Stanley walked downstairs with them. And he said that was the, the thing that everyone was so afraid of in the early 50s. So, um, and also, something that I don't think my father really understood, because my father was the head of a Jewish gang in Brooklyn in the 30s, and every time his father would close the candy store and move a few blocks and reopen it, um, he had to fight, his gang had to fight the Irish and the Italian mm -hmm. gangs. And, and these were bloody fights, and these were sometimes to the death, like ripping out um, antennas from cars and sticking them in people's eyes. And this was Pete prior to the war. And then he went to the war with his enemies, and he... When they came back, and he had a violent war, and very dramatic, but when he came back, he came back not with enemies, but with brothers, guys who'd been through this experience with him. And, and uh, I don't think that he realized that his former enemies were now his best friends and neighbors. And I remember talking to one of his friends who was uh, Italian. And I said, I get it. I get it. Your totalitarian psychopath is better than his totalitarian psychopath. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and that's, and I laughed myself sick, and so did he. And he, he laughed so much that his milk spilled up through his nose. So I found at a very early age that most of the partisanship uh, in American politics was nonsense. And, and I've always felt that way. I, I certainly, I was, at the very most, I was a Democrat at the, at the, at the height of my <laughs> partisan politics. I was a Democrat or a liberal, but I wasn't really 
and would never have voted a straight party ticket. And so when I started in my career talking about this stuff, I would always say that I was not a liberal, that I was a libo, conservo, rado, middle of the rodo. Just like most of you, you just haven't given it enough thought lately. And, and I hold to that to this day. And I think that most, um, by reducing our politics to this bitter and, un, and ignorant partisanship, we do ourselves vast disservices and we should know better. And, and nowadays, uh, Republicans or, or conservatives can't wait to bring up the word liberal as a curse word and vice versa. Democrats do the same thing with conservatives. And the fact is, none of us are a straight ticket country. We, we don't do things like that. And we should know more. Uh, one of the simple reasons for knowing civics is that you know from the get-go, from the beginning, that opposing views are meant to be cherished. And if you don't, you are missing out on something that is a remarkable uh, strength to our system. That, that's supposed and, to be a liberal value. Well, it's supposed to be an American value. So it's not just liberals, it's conservatives too. And, 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 and we got so far away from that in such a short amount of time that it, this is all uh, post 60s and it's done, uh, it was accomplished by what I call the James Dean generation, the ones who were too old to take acid with me and too young to help their fathers in World War II. And they were without mission. They were, uh, they were stuck in, in nothingness. And like in the Dean film, you know, he was always yelling, you're tearing me apart. Things were being demanded of him that tore him apart. And uh, when Brando did The Wild One, he was asked, what are you rebelling against? And Brando said, what have you got? And that's our tradition, our, our most immediate tradition. And by not knowing uh, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration, by not knowing the birth tale of America, we cheat ourselves tremendously and we change the values that are so important and so unique to us. Opposing views, what other country cherishes opposing views like we do? One country does, and that's the country that says, my right honorable opponent, when they talk in Parliament in Britain, they always address their worst enemy with the most respect. And that's the tradition that we came from. And for us to deny that, or for us to walk away from that, or feel in some way compelled for either side, conservative or liberal, to have to put down the other side it's, it's not enough to disagree with people. You are called upon to put them down personally. There are people who wouldn't consider it a good day if they hadn't put down some liberals as idiots. And the fact is, it's, they're not idiots. And we are not idiots. And the American political philosophy of... Uh, a Republican democracy is not an idiotic thing. It's a brilliant discovery. And we changed the world. And we are, we lost the pride of that. And we've reduced the pride of that system to the partisanship of the Republicans or the Democrats. And George Washington 
said a very, very important thing. He said that the Constitution must always be central and the parties must always be peripheral. And we're living in the exact opposite world mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And that means that you, you're not a good conservative unless you're putting down the Democrats and vice versa. You're not a good Democrat unless you're putting down conservative philosophy. And that's nonsense. And it's, it's horse shit. And, and we should grow up and stop it. Well, because let me let me pause you there for a moment because I, I don't know how familiar you are with with what I do here, but I mean, really, what you're discussing is really why I started this show and what I've been trying to do for many years. And uh, as as a Brooklyn-born guy who grew up in Long Island, lived in a crazy LA for eight years, and now I'm in the free state of Florida, my life ha is actually very much in line with with what you're talking about right there. But I want to just jump back to to the communist thing for a moment because I think that'll sort of help frame why you care so much about the founding documents and all of those things. Um, do you think that maybe in the 50s or earlier when, when these people were avowed communists in the United States, and it's hard for people of a younger generation to kind of understand that, but they're really, they were communists and they had meetings in basements and things like that. Do you think to, to sort of give the devil his due on that, that they felt that the system could work enough that it would actually make sense? as opposed to now, let's say, where I think a lot of people think the system no longer functions in a way so that communist control over everything wouldn't work. But like your parents, did they feel that there was a way that you could exercise enough control over this system that it would be functional and genuinely help people? Would that be a, a fair estimation? Well, uh, let me put it this way. All during the 50s, <clears throat> all during the time when we were so passionate, either opposed to or in favor of communism, um, that, th that feeling was not an informed and educated feeling. It was a feeling that people gained from their poverty, from the history of their poverty, both in the old countries and, and here. And they were not looking to destroy the American system they were part of a legitimate, uh, what's the word? Uh, they were American communists within a system that accommodated American communism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And America was strong enough and confident enough that they could say, sure, be a communist, who cares? Because it's not going to take over our system. Mm -hmm. and, and that was something that people so easily forgot so quickly. God. Yeah, is that is that what strikes you as as most uh, the starkest difference between the say sort of self-proclaimed communists or socialists of today, where it really is sort of let's burn it down, as opposed to let's operate within the system, something like that. I think I, I think that if you are aware of the history of American labor or uh, middle class development or anything, you're going to know that America was strong enough to accommodate a legal communist system, communist party, from the very beginning. It never once was attacked as illegitimate. The attack was like ex extra. It was, they, they didn't even include the legitimate party, the communist party. They just attacked the that weird entity known as communism and it was an international something ghost-like craziness and and stalin gave them good reason to fear them and the guys that i knew who were communists were always communists because of domestic uh, reasons because of the depression because of lack of work and things like that. They were not um, uh, educated to international, you know, Marxism, etc. And that stuff can be pretty easily dispensed with. You know, you don't have to read Marcuse to, to understand that it's illegit, you know. And it's too bad that it wasn't allowed to just 
duke, you know, have a duke out, lit an intellectual debate between communism and and uh, it's like the the Nixon uh, Khrushchev kitchen debate that they had. Uh, that was important. That was an important thing, and it actually really made a difference. You know, they the, the Nixon. Um, stood up for commodities and private enterprise and like that. And Khrushchev uh, wanted to, you know, nail him to a wall. Too bad. He could have learned something. And, and to turn over a, a, country's, a country as big as Russia and turn it over completely to a bunch of apparatchniks that didn't know anything about the industries they were running. Not a good thing. And ultimately, it was going to fail. Sort of, sort of sounds a little bit like what we have now with a lot of uh, people that are running things that don't know exactly what they're doing. So you mentioned that you would describe yourself in sort of different ways. You obviously became... A-list Hollywood star for several decades, but Hollywood is known as this, you know, sort of lefty, socialist, whatever place. They're not too kind to some of the ideas that you're writing, certainly about in this book, about civics and pride in America and things like that. Um, I know you think it's, uh, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you believe it's affected your career later, but do you think it affected your career early on? I mean, there was obviously a, a tremendous amount of success there. Uh, you mean, did uh, w was I frightened by its negative effect on me? Yeah. Never. Yeah, by not beaten, by not just b jumping in and yes, I'm just like you guys on everything. No, I never, it never occurred to me to be like that. It never occurred to me that I would be hurt by it. And when I have friends who are on the other side, who are, you know, uh, conservative writers and such, who say that they've been blacklisted, I like to turn to... Uh, my friend Lionel Chetwin and say, Lionel, you have not been out of work since Hanoi Hilton. <laughs> You're always working. Don't tell me you've been blacklisted. And, and I think that there's a kind of romance to being blacklisted, so you want mm -hmm. in on that. But we, uh, we play fast and loose with our insults and pejoratives. And we don't explain enough. I think that there's more books that come out recently that are written by conservatives who call liberals um, traitors, basically traitors. And that's crazy. And, and, the, and, and liberals who do the same thing about conservatives are nuts. And they should control themselves. And one of the things about civics is that you learn how to be civil. And that's a controlled um, way of communication. And if you can do that, you can always come out on top. If you reduce all discussions to yelling and screaming and interrupting, you lose and we lose. Do you sense that part of that is because the culture has gone so askew? I, I try not to blame all the politicians all the time for how screwy everything seems because they're just a function of us. And culturally, we, at an educational level, we don't teach a lot of these things. We don't teach civics that well. Our education, obviously public education, ain't great to say the least. Um, the stuff that now comes out of Hollywood and through big tech and everything else, it's often very slanted that, that sort of, we're having like a cultural crisis in a way that then leads to the political dilemma that you're talking about. I think it's, I don't know whether it's the egg or the chicken. I don't know which comes first. I do know that uh, uh, Hollywood has a liberal reputation. Um, and I always cringe when I watch the Oscars and wait for some beautiful, talented actress to say something stupid about some, some issue. Um, yeah. But to tell us that we're they, all racist, now come to my movie. Yeah, right. 
And it's kind of silly. And it, and it should be seen as silly. It should not be seen as, I hate her, I'll never talk to her, and I'll never go to her movies. And uh, they take it far too seriously in that way. And, and conservatives make it far too serious when they were in the 50s, when all the owners of the companies were way over to the right, and they and they would hire liberals to write their scripts, mm -hmm. and and they they created a picture of America in small town Andy Hardy ways that was beautiful and very persuasive, and they had no women, no blacks, no Jews, nothing. It was a Protestant small town America, and. It was as wrong-headed as you can get, and but it, it, that's okay if, as long as you let the other side have its say. You know, let the conservatives have their say, and the conservatives do not have to be Ayn Rand. They can be small-town America, and. Um, one of my favorite films is The Oxbow Incident. And that's the story of a town that goes mad and hangs the wrong guys. And at the end of that film, when the sheriff comes and says, he's not dead, he's, he's at his ranch. And anyone who participated in this is going to be up for murder. And that's the whole town. And there's, it's a complex thing. It's, nothing is so simple. And for us to make uh, the, the claim that politics can be simple, it's not fair. It's not right. Yeah. Do you find that there's a bit of an asymmetry in the way, if you want to sort of be above the fray, but the way each side might treat you? If I'm not mistaken, I think in 2015, you were spotted at the back of a Ted Cruz rally or something like that, and, and people started calling you all these, <laughs> all of these awful names, and you're a crazy right winger, and you know all of this stuff. And I, I remember seeing that, I think, on YouTube or something, thinking I didn't know anything about your politics beforehand. It didn't matter to me. You're a great actor. Uh, I happen to, you know, now I really like Ted Cruz. I, I didn't like him as much at the moment, but okay, you were just in the back of the room, if I can picture the video again. Um, but that a certain side went crazy on you, but had it been the other way around, had you shown up to say uh, a Hillary Clinton rally, I, I don't know that you would have got hate, that it's not exactly equal. I get the idea of that you wanna be above the craziness, but right now it does seem to me, and I wrote my whole first book was a defense of liberalism, uh, of classical liberalism. Uh, it does seem to me there is an asymmetry that we're all struggling with right now in terms of how each side behaves. Not to say that the conservatives don't have their bad actors too. I think, uh, I think if you can start out by thinking that one side is inherently better than the other, that it is um, more easy to perceive the morality of the GOP as opposed to the Democrats, then you're nuts because they're all equally nuts. The Democrats are and the, so are the Republicans. And what happened in that year was that I simply went to the Republican caucus in Iowa to watch. And it was... You crazy radical. <laughs> and, and, yeah. And it was, um, what's his name? The, the guy that you mentioned. It's Ted Cruz. Just yeah. in, no, no, not Ted Cruz. It wasn't Ted Cruz. It, it wasn't Ted Cruz? It. Who was it? No. It was... Um, uh, uh, was it Rubio? Was it was... No, it wasn't a candidate. He was a, a, a columnist, a, a commentator. And he ju you just mentioned him at the beginning of the interview. Um, uh, he outed me. Okay. He outed me. He, he, did, he wrote a column about what was Richard Dreyfuss doing at the Iowa caucuses. And then the liberals went crazy. <laughs> and, then, and all of my friends and right. associates just couldn't leave it alone. And my son, who at that time was 
quite young, he wrote a piece that was on the internet where he was saying, why is my actor father in a position to give lessons in ethics to America? And, and so, what's her name? Uh, uh, Megan Kelly invited us on her show when she was still with Fox. So we, the two of us went on. And for me, it was simply, if you're a smart person, you scrutinize, you read everything. You don't read you what, what reinforces your already assumed habits. And, you know, I, I hold being a high school history teacher to be just about second to being an actor. An actor is the best thing on earth to do, unless you're a high school history teacher. And then I would say, how many kids here in this room uh, have the same politics as their parents? And whatever number of hands goes up, I say, for this semester, you take the opposite view. Under compulsion, you do not agree with your parents, and I don't care. I want you to disagree with your parents on parents every paper. Parents really love this. Well, it never happened, so I never got <laughs> to know. And, and I, I watched, I, I graduated in 65. By 69, there were kids who had the legal right to get up and leave any class that they just disagreed with. Well, that's stupid. That's a stupid thing to do. You don't turn over the future of your country to people who are making life decisions when they're 16 and a half. No. In retrospect, no, knowing that, what the 16 and a half year olds were doing, you know, in 69, now these people are running the country. I mean, I guess this isn't shocking where we're at, huh? No, it isn't. You're right, because what happened was that it was the generation that, be, that took power after the 60s. They were the 70, 70 to 72 school board members. They're the ones who thought that they were smart enough to tell the founding fathers to take a hike and not educate. You know, we, we came up with a unique system and it was unique. And, and we said, we will educate you to this system and then you are obligated to pass it on to your kids. And that was serious business and we did that. And that didn't guarantee a Republican future or a Democratic future. It said that both sides had something to offer. And if you did, for instance, I would always say as, as a history buff, I would say there's no such thing as one great history. There's always at least two that can, you know, oppose one another. And if you don't see the, the advantage to that, then sh slow down and shut up and listen more. Are, are you hopeful that we'll get there? I am pretty convinced that we are in the last stages of of the ability for America to survive. We are in an end game right now, and that is not a liberal end game or a conservative end game. It's a combination of both, and we are um, without mercy, and we are without forgiveness. And we have to, we have to rethink that. We have to get it back into the earliest years of public schools so that your, your civic education is complete by high school graduation. It has nothing to do with college or university. And the more you explore that, 
the more you'll see why that's simple and commonsensical. And the founders knew everyone had to be educated to a certain kind of participatory citizenship. And they knew that. It had nothing to do with those who could afford to go on to university. That was creating exactly what that, why they had left the British Empire. So if they had some informed pride, they should be as proud as punch to give their youngest of their young a real grounding in civics. So it's interesting because I, I talk about a lot on the show how we are at this moment, what you're describing as an end game. We seem to be at a moment in the country where we can basically go two ways at this point. We can either figure out how to you know, be, maintain ourselves as the United States of America, or the states really just kind of need to go their separate ways. And that's sort of what federalism is about in the first place. But then what makes us united and will we end up in perpetual civil war? And you know, there's a litany of problems with that. So describe what, what endgame, I mean, endgame can go two ways, right? Endgame can be, we end up in just utter chaos, or there is something that comes after endgame that's positive, right? Um, let me Hopefully, put it I suppose. Way. If you believe that you have to find that which we share and not that which, we, which divides us, we should be proud of opposing views. We should be proud of having dissent. And they have always been the hallmarks of America, always, until so recently that people don't understand what history itself is. But that's what you've got to fight. You don't have a choice between having the United States and having chaos because that's not a choice. That's, it may be fatal, it may be the worst possible thing that could happen to us, but what we should be doing is agreeing on the need for civics. And when I went to the Wall Street Journal, I was so shocked that they wouldn't endorse civics for everyone, and they said, they implied to me that they thought that uh, liberal teachers in civics had a hidden agenda. And I said, a hidden agenda in civics? Yeah. I said, you're nuts. You're crazy. There's no such thing as a hidden agenda in the teaching of civics. You either have honest history or you don't. You either lie your way through history or you don't. And you, eat, and you are willing to tell the truth. And if you tell the truth about the Bill of Rights, why is the Bill of Rights called the Bill of Rights? Why is it in the Constitution in a way that none of the other amendments are? And it, it has, there's a reason. And there's a reason that breeds pride and breeds love of country. You don't have to be in the military to have love of country. You have to know why Nathan, uh, Nathan Hale died. You have to know why uh, George Washington tried to throw the coin across the river. And you know those stories, and you'll know who you are. And without them, you don't know who you are. And. I may say that, I will say that uh, when we divide up between commentators that are conservative, commentators that are uh, liberal, uh, we're reducing American politics and American government and American history to an anecdote. And it's nonsense, nonsense, because there's no such thing as a pure conservative or a pure liberal. And we always are borrowing and, and, and uh, uh, exchanging positions and using the positions of your opponents. We're always doing that and should. 
and that and that's what's so great about living here you know people who come from overseas they don't go to norway they don't say oh i can't wait to get to norway i can't wait to get to uganda they can't wait to get to america because america is the only country that offers them the opportunity to have opportunity the and only nobody country leaves. Nobody leaves. Forget who's coming. Nobody leaves. That's that's the weird that's one. Right. Um, I want to I want to end with one thing that could sort of connect your your love of history and civics and and clearly America to to what we know the the career that we all know, and and how that sort of is relating to Hollywood these days. It seems like I can go on Apple movies every day and literally I'll just scroll and scroll and scroll, and I can't find anything new that is interesting to me. It's it's almost impossible. It feels like the, the studios are, are out of ideas. We, you know, we remake and we reboot and we retread and now you know, the studios have all come together and so there's just not a plethora of ideas anymore. And I end up watching the same, I actually watched What About Bob about two weeks ago on a Sunday. I, I end up watching the same things that I was always watching uh, for most of my life as a child of the 80s and the 90s. Um, do you think Hollywood can shift to help with some of this, that there could be some stories? I mean, there's plenty of stories from our past that could help us understand some of this better. We used to be able to tell them, but we don't seem to be able to tell them anymore. Or maybe it's not Hollywood that should be doing it. Well, it's not just Hollywood. That's true. But I, I, I have found that um, there's a whole series of books by Howard Fast and um, others who I've wanted to to turn into films. And I've been told, no, no, that's agitprop. That was communist agitprop. Are you crazy? You're talking about some book that was, he wrote Spartacus. That's a, that's a pro-communist book. What are you, nuts? And yet that's how they were dismissed. And didn't a lot of the guys who wrote that end up getting blacklisted in Hollywood? Yeah, yeah, they did. They were, and Howard was one of them. And I went to Howard and I said, when he was in his 90s, I said, I'm going to get your stuff done. I am. And then I had to come to him some 10 years later and say, I'm so sorry, but I, I still can't get you done. I can't get it done. People don't, they don't read what they, what's in front of them. They read the rep. And, and I don't care anymore. And, I, and I, I don't want anyone to really care. If you're a communist and you've written a brilliant book like Animal Farm or 1984, do you really think you're going to be poisoning the, the, the brains of your children what, by introducing them to 1984? Good grief. We have, no, we have no sense of risk, and we have no trust in our children's brains. And that's a terrible, terrible flaw. Richard, I don't think we can end on terrible, terrible flaw. We got to end with something positive here. Help me bring, How help me bring this home. Okay, agree with me. All oh, I well. want is to agree with me. Well, I agree with, of course, I agree with the premise that we got to let go of some of this hate and we got to stop. You know, I, I don't know how much you know about me, but I'm, I'm married to a man with two kids. I'm pro-choice and people write about me all day long what a, what a far-right conservative I am. So I get it, these labels make no sense. We're all an amalgamation of a million different ideas. I, I, someone born in New York, only lived in New York and LA my entire life until the last year in Florida. So I think I'm in some ways a living, breathing example of some of the stuff that you're well, talking that about. Last year and why, Florida, did I come, really? why did I come to Florida? For freedom. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, uh, keep it up and, uh, and bring it up. Don't limit yourself to your, whatever your partisanship is, because that's d disaster. And you're more than your party affiliation, and you're more than your general. 
st to stand up for what America introduced to the world in 1787 is not a small thing. And it took courage on the part of the country, and it took courage on the part of the public, and, and that's what's missing. We have no sense of pride, no sense of courage, no sense of risk, and we should. And we should do things that raise up such pride. And that means risking the, the brains of your children. I often end the show by saying I have nothing better to do than save the world. I sense that's your mission too. Yep, that's exactly my mission. It's really been a pleasure, Richard. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks a lot. Thank you. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics, instead of mindless drivel, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.